with that, we will get our next speaker ready, who is Dan Co. Dan, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for everything. Thanks for this conference, and uh, you know, it's great to be here. Um, it's a great tradition. I think you've started with these Sazerac conferences, and I hope to continue next year, hopefully in person. It'd be great to see all of you. Um, so yeah, I'm Dan Coe at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, um, where I'm, a, I'm an astronomer. I also, um, I'm a near-cam instrument scientist, so I, I support um, all of you and your proposals, um, and then in, uh, in the, the program implementation, and also the data analysis, um, which we're all looking forward to. Um, and we're in Baltimore, um, which has been Cicada Central lately, so that's been a lot of fun. And... All right, so let's let's dive in. Um, so yeah, as as we've been talking about, it's been great to hear about all these great um, JWST programs, and congratulations to everybody who's, who's gotten time. Um, and so, ten thousand hours of uh, of observations are um, are being planned. Uh, for, uh, for cycle one, um, over 2,000 of those hours will be public immediately, um, and we can hope to start seeing data uh, around this time next year, assuming all goes well. Um, so we, we've heard plenty of talks about the, the many blank fields and also lensing clusters that we'll be observing with James Webb. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the lensing clusters in this talk, um, and I wanted to give an overview of the, the different observing programs. Um, and so why lensing? Um, I, one of the, the simplest reasons I can give you is I think that um, lensing will be the key to discovering the first galaxies with JWST. You, you also saw Evo show this. Um, and, you know, th this is my um, prediction given naive uh, assumptions. Um, but if the luminosity functions continue to steepen, there'll be many small faint galaxies. The lensing uh, advantage will multiply even more at high redshifts. Uh, but this all remains to be seen. And it's going to be difficult to, to look through the cluster light. Um, so we have to make sure our tools are up to that, that task. Um, and th the other main reason, of course, is lensing magnification allows you to, uh, to see much smaller structures than you would be able to, to do otherwise. Um, I borrowed this slide from Jane Rigby showing parsec scale structures in a galaxy at, uh, I think, about redshift two in this case, and what it would look with and without lensing. Um, so, all right, so the, the Windhorst, uh, Roger Windhorst GTO program is observing seven lensing clusters. I'm, I'm a part of that effort. Um, and that's primarily near cam imaging. Um, and you'll see the, the, the top three of these, the frontier fields clusters are also being observed by other programs, which I've, I've shown here, um, including uh, Chris Willett's nearest GTO Canucks program um, and uh, observing five of these clusters with nearest um, to get spectroscopy. Um, and some of these clusters are being observed by the, the same program or multiple epics, which is great um, because they enable searches for transients, which include individual stars at high redshifts. So we might find supernovae or microlensing transits, um, unexploded stars uh, within the first billion years, which would be very exciting. So far, we, we see a few examples here of, of uh, individual stars observed at around redshifts of one. Uh, so here's a, a spreadsheet that you can uh, screenshot of the various GTO and ERS programs. Um, so I've, uh, and the, the different instruments, a lot of spectroscopy, also imaging. Um, so far I've covered the, these uh, in, the, in the box here. What I haven't mentioned are the individual targets um, that are being targeted by these programs. And I haven't mentioned Jane Rigby's program yet. Um, so I'm gonna show those here on this next slide. So I, I had a lot of fun putting this together. Um, these are images of the, the various uh, strongly lensed galaxies that will be observed in cycle one. Um, this is Jane Rigby's program over here. Um, it, instead of the, the largest arcs, uh, she picked galaxies that would fit inside the IFUs to study those in detail. Um, here you see the, the larger arcs. Um, this isn't to scale. So I had some more fun um, putting all of this to the same scale on the sky. Um, you can see the sunburst arc is the, um, the, the most, uh, is the brightest galaxy on our sky, uh, very brightly lensed and magnified. Um, you also see a quiescent galaxy at redshift two. Um, here's the brightest redshift five galaxy known and the most highly magnified redshift six galaxy known. This is a more recent discovery from my relics program that my student Brian Welch will talk about more on Wednesday. Uh, at the bottom, you can see more typical sizes for these higher redshift galaxies, um, exceedingly small, all the way up to redshift 11. And these will all be targets in, in cycle one. 
So here then are the observations of these galaxies. Um, that Evo uh, gave a great talk about Uncover. Very exciting to have deep imaging and spectroscopy um, within the first year of a galaxy cluster. Um, and these are all, um, there's near spec uh, spectroscopy for all of these at different resolutions. Um, these programs are all observing with the lo at lower resolution with the prism getting the full wavelength range. And then there's other uh, medium and high resolution observations. And most of these also have near cam imaging. And apologies if I missed any. Um, you, you could actually contribute. Um, so I, I started a spreadsheet uh, where I've, I've been cataloging all these high redshift targets in the field and also in lens, uh, lens surveys. Um, please uh, contribute. Um, it's, it's incomplete so far. Um, I, I saw um, Christina also uh, do a lot of this compilation in a double AS talk. Madeline could help me out with the quasars. Please, uh, you know, uh, contribute to this. Um, this is here for, uh, for everyone. And so I'd like to also focus on my own programs. Um, so uh, programs to observe the, uh, the most distant lensed galaxy known at Redshift 11, and then also this uh, most highly magnified galaxy at Redshift 6. Um, and I'll, I'll be, I'll mention, I'll be looking for a postdoc to help out uh, when these when these data start coming in around next summer or fall. Um, so I, I, these are thanks to, to large teams that we uh, created for this, bringing in a lot of expertise that I, I didn't have to, to do this type of science. Um, and similar observational setups, so near cam imaging and the near spec uh, prism um, for both of these. And so with... With that, for the Redshift 11 galaxy, for example, um, pretty standard uh, filter set. I also added the reddest near cam filter F480M to get the, the Balmer break at Redshift 11. Um, I, I really wanted to add Miri uh, to go after O3 and H alpha, um, but my, my co eyes talked me down in terms of uh, asking for too many hours. And also, I realized that um, it, my proposal will be a lot different, uh, hopefully, in cycle two. Um, depending on whether we see 800 nanojanskis or 200 nanojanskis, we'll need different exposure times. Um, so I look forward to that next cycle. Um, and then here's a, an example of what we hope to see with the near cam, uh, near spec prism, um, the, the lines we do hope to see, um, giving you obviously the redshift and then some constraints on metallicity and ionization parameter and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we'll be able to, to really just nail uh, with these observations, you know, there's been a lot of uncertainty at redshifts, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight um, for stellar mass measurements with the emission line contamination. Um, you know, obviously, we can do that a lot more cleanly with, uh, with JWST. Um, and at redshift 11, we might see even higher uh, specific star formation rates. So that's something that we'll measure very cleanly. And we will resolve, uh, we'll, hopefully we'll spatially resolve this galaxy. Um, the current upper limit is a radius of 80 parsecs. So it's a very small, it's the size of star forming regions in our own galaxy. Uh, we'll get down to 30 parsecs. Might just be seeing the tip of the iceberg with Hubble. And at Redshift 6, even more exciting, um, this uh, strongly lensed galaxy. Um, so Brian will talk about on Wednesday how he's done the lens modeling. And he, he sees seven clumps, multiply imaged. Um, and they're less than 10 parsecs in radius each, um, going, out to eight, uh, going out to about 500 parsecs. Um, and for each of those individual clumps, um, we'll get these types of measurements um, for you know, the, the metallicity, um, ionization parameter, things like that. We'll, we'll be able to measure metallicity gradients um, with all these clumps in a, a galaxy in the first billion years. So very exciting. Um, and th 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 just to illustrate that these are very extreme clumps, um, smaller than have been seen before in other galaxies, uh, bound clumps at, at higher redshift. And we'll be able to do that science. Um, I have, looks like I have a minute to go over the a possible timeline for all of this, um, launch followed by six months of commissioning. Um, and so our observations, if they go the earliest they might go, um, we might get them around here. Um, all of, I've made all of our data public immediately. Um, I hope to put out results quickly also for the community. attending hopefully i've put sazerac on the hook for uh you know three and four coming up here and um 
I, I'd say a few words real quick about, I, I want to figure out how to rapidly release results with public data. Um, I think there is an issue with uh, press releases that you might want to wait a little bit longer. Um, but of course, with public data, um, you know, other teams can come in and, and also put that on the archive. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to put out exciting results um, without uh, going against those uh the, those uh, those press release embargoes, um, and then just to say, you know, I'm I'm excited to see these data, uh, you know, already. Um, so I've begun, you know, simulating these. Um, we have tools available at, at Space Telescope um, for all the different observing modes, um, and uh, you know, I plan to build a lot of this up too. I, I have a lot of the pieces in place, but I know other people are working on this, and I, I welcome your your contributions from you know Christina and other people to make sure we have the best tools available for the the community. And I will leave it there uh, with with my conclusions. And I'm you know looking forward to that we all are able to hit the ground running when the data start coming in next summer. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dan. So please place your questions in the Slack, and we'll wait a little bit and see what pops up. Yeah, there was lots of great stuff there, Dan. Can I um? Can I make a request? And, and so some of these spreadsheets that you've built and some of the tools that you've built, maybe you can publicize these via one of the relevant Slack channels. Um, there, there were so many great things you, you've been posting here. I kind of lost track of some of it. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm I'll... a very big fan of open tools, so. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I've also seen other people talk about their, their tools, and I'm, I'm looking forward to trying those out. Tools, or uh, you know, we can make one. Yeah, I can't remember if we had a channel already for tools. I don't think maybe we don't at the moment, but yeah, we could make a, a channel. Um, tools, I think that would be a good idea. Can I ask a, a question while we're waiting for maybe some to show up in Slack? So, Dan, one of your, your later slides was about. Um, uh, like how to publish and press releases and competing teams and all that. So, did you was there actually a suggestion you have there, or what are you what are you thinking there? No, I'm stumped, and I, I welcome your expertise. I almost emailed you uh, last week. Um, yeah, what what do you think? I don't. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to think about it. <laughs> um, no, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, I think you know there have been exciting new data sets released multiple times and and i've lived through it i guess at least once and i think long term the community sort of averages together things that get published over a couple month time period as you know the first result so whether it's on day one or day 20 you know, probably not not too big of a deal but it's a good it's a good thing to think about so maybe that would be a good topic for people to gather one of the breaks and chat about yeah and and i just to be clear I, i'm thinking of you know my I, my idea is even more radical than uh you know a archive paper draft you know what if you put something on the archive with just the result you know to, to just get it out there quickly if you know you want to support the community um but you know but if you got to wait for a press release then it, it would take longer so yeah i'm not sure how to reconcile that yeah yeah i think i think we are kind of missing something right i, I think it's i think it's fair that people certainly running these big public programs should be able to kind of make a claim on some objects and kind of say, look, we found these interesting objects. Please go ahead and see if you see the same objects before you get to the point of having a formal paper. Um, I wonder if there is something intermediate um, that we could explore. It's an interesting idea. Just imagine how many press releases there are going to be this time next year though. Right. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Yeah. Not seeing any questions. I'm surprised. Well, people can can oh. take time to think about them and add them add them to the Slack, and Dan can check it later. Yeah, I'll also join the Wonder Me later. I'll stick around after these talks, and uh, you know, look forward to chat with people. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dan.